Welcome to Buy, Sell, Hold, the sports car market podcast. Market experts and car friends for over 30 years, Keith Martin and Mark Green have come together through their mutual love for collector cars. Keith and Mark will take you on a ride into the collector car market, talking with industry experts, helping you navigate your collector car journey so that you know when to make your own decisions to buy, sell, or hold. Hello, I'm Mark Green from the Cars Yeah! Podcast. And I'm Keith Martin from Sports Car Market Magazine. I want to welcome you to this edition of Buy, Sell, Hold, what we like to call the essence of collecting. And this is our show number 11. So, Keith, good morning. How are you doing today, buddy? I'm doing good. I'm full of thoughts about car collecting, and I can't wait to talk with you about them. We're going to have some fun with this guest today for sure. But before this guest calls in, I wanted to get your impressions on something. You're a guy who takes his cars out and uses them. You're kind of nudging me to be more of that guy. We've had those talks about, I'm so picky with my car. I think you're going to break me eventually here. I'm like a wild horse. You know, you just got to work, work, work. But I want you to share with our listeners some of the very important things that you do when spring comes. And spring is in the air now. Thank goodness it's here. And people are pulling their cars out of their garages, their storage, and they're going to go out and enjoy them. But there's some key things to do so you don't end up on the side of the road. So what's some of your advice, Keith? Mark, the most important thing is to start early. In other words, if you have a Sunday touring event with your local club, don't wait until Sunday at 8 o'clock in the morning (laughs) to go start your car up that's been sitting there for six or eight or nine months. You're just putting the gun to your head if you do that. A week before the uh, the tour, go over and start your car. Uh, Check the tire pressures. Take the car out and warm it up. I mean, I've had situations where cars, clutch discs have frozen up to the the uh, pressure plate with my Rover uh, Defender 90. My Defender 90 has got a small leak uh, in the power steering pump. It's very expensive to fix that for some reason, a couple thousand dollars. Uh, and power steering fluid is cheap. But it means that I need to go be sure that I top off the power steering fluid uh, before I take the car out. I also check all the fluid levels. I check the oil. I check the uh, brake fluid. You just kind of eyeball the car. And then when you fire it up, you know, I've, I have read that letting a car warm up sitting in place at idle is not the best way to do it. The best way is to put the car under load and to drive it slowly. So 10, 15 miles an hour, just kind of snick it out of the driveway, snick it into gear and out of the driveway and just drive around slowly and let the water temperature come up. And and then then you've got a car. So on Sunday morning, when you run and jump in your car at eight o'clock, uh, the car will fire up and you'll be on your way. But don't wait until Sunday morning. I know I've had situations where I was taking my Duetto out and I checked the oil just before I took the car out. When I checked the oil, I didn't realize it, but I knocked the hot wire off the coil. The car wouldn't start. I thought, well, how did this happen? You yeah. know, it started three minutes ago. Yeah. How did this happen to me? Well, but I had I had the time to kind of poke around and find the loose wire, and then I was up and gone. But give yourself time and don't get gas the day before the tour. Make your life simple. Yeah, absolutely. Another quick tip I'll offer there, Keith, is uh, my car tends to sit a bit during the wintertime because it rains a lot. I know most people are thinking, who cares? But I do. One thing I did the other day was I have a 87 Turbo. I've had it for about 11 years and went out and I was going to take it for a drive and Check the tire pressures. That's kind of a basic yes. thing people do. But while I was down there, I went, when did I buy these tires uh, 11 years ago? Yep. They don't look yep. like 11-year-old tires, but they are probably a good idea to call up our friends at uh, a local tire provider uh, that will fit that car. It's got a weird size. Uh, and get some new tires on the car to be safe, especially a car that you might be driving faster than normal. So some great tips. Uh, those listeners out there, we'd love to to hear from you guys. Uh, you can go to Sports Car Market. There's a place under the shows uh, on the Sports Car Market website to leave a comment. So uh, do that for us. Maybe some tips you might add to us. We're going to be back in a minute with a, another guy named Mark. But first, a special offer from Keith's team at Sports Car Market just for you listeners. We'll be right back. Mark Green here. I have subscribed to Sports Car Market Magazine for decades. While I've dropped most of my other car magazine subscriptions, Sports Car Market is the one I'll never let go. It's a hold. Getting it monthly in my mailbox brings a huge smile to my face. Sports Car Market Magazine is filled with great articles and market updates on collector car values. It's a virtual treasure trove of value. 
Even the advertisements are fun to watch. Boy, I've got a deal for you. You're going to get $10 off your print subscription simply by using the code BSH on their website. Go to sportscarmarket.com slash BSH. Use the code BSH and get 10 bucks off your print subscription of Sports Car Market Magazine. That's a deal. That's code BSH at sportscarmarket.com slash BSH and get $10 off your print subscription today. So, Mark, who will we be talking with today? Well, we're talking with an old friend of yours today, Mark Hyman on Buy, Sell, Hold. Mark Hyman is the founder, of course, of Hyman Limited, one of the largest and most respected collector vehicle dealers in the world. He's based in St. Louis, Missouri. Hyman Limited's 70,000 square foot facility is filled with a diverse inventory of over 200 of the world's finest automobiles, covering virtually every era and genre imaginable from the horse's carriage to modern era supercars and pretty much everything in between. After more than 30 years in operation, Mark and his expert staff of 15 serve a global clientele through sales, procurement, and a highly successful consignment program. When not in the office, you can find Mark meeting old friends and new friends out at Concours events, rallies, tours, and automotive gatherings around the world. So Mark, welcome to Buy, Sell, Hold. How are you doing today, buddy? I'm doing great. Thank you. Great to have you here. Hello, Mark. Welcome to Buy, Sell, Hold. If you could describe the collector car market today in just one word, what would that word be and why would you choose it? <laughs> Uh-oh, we've stumped, we've stumped our first guest, unless laughing is his answer. <laughs> no, 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 no. It, it, it's hard to do that in one word, guys. Very, well, of seriously. course. Like, We're I, not going to give I you the easy like- questions, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, but seriously, no, I'd like to treat that question with the importance that it deserves. The question that you asked me was, how would I describe the collector car market today? And yep. I think the answer, if I were to give you one word, I would say complex. Okay. Uh, you could do it. We knew you could do it. That's a great thing. <laughs> and yeah, and what do word? I mean by complex? First of all, the market is really, really, really great. Our business is rocking, but there has been and is currently going on a lot of changes. So I think that to give you an idea of what I think those changes are, I think A, we have a market adjustment, but B, we also have a demographic shift. So when you combine those two things, You cannot say the market is fabulous. You cannot say the market is terrible. What you can say is that the market is in flux. I have been in business 30 years, and one of the reasons that we have been successful for 30 years and one of the reasons that our business continues to get better every year is the ability that we have to shift our focus with the market and to cater to the needs of our clients. So for many, many years, so we, we stock roughly 200 cars. And as you mentioned earlier, it's a, a really large, diverse offering of automobiles. So because of that, we are able to sense what's going on in many different segments of the marketplace. And we're always selling cars. Sometimes we're selling pre-war Packards and Bugattis. Sometimes we're selling post-war Ferraris and, and 300 SLs. And you know, other times we're selling all the crazy things in between. But having a, a big, diverse offering of cars gives us the ability to understand what's working at the moment, what's not working at the moment, and, and what the trends are. So when I use the word complex, I use that word and I don't use it loosely because I've spent the last 12, 14 months really studying, focusing, and trying to understand what's going on. I'll summarize that briefly. We could, I don't, I know you don't want me to take 10 hours, but it's a 10 hour discussion. But to summarize it, I would say this the market is great, the amount of interest is unbelievable, the interest that we're getting is different today than it was over the last six, seven, eight years. I think that post-2009 through about 2014, maybe 2015, maybe 2015, we saw an enormous amount of interest in automobiles of any kind from people who enjoyed automobiles, liked automobiles, but weren't what 
I might call a true car guy. Okay. They were people that liked the cars, liked the social aspect of owning the cars, and more importantly, liked the economic benefit or the perceived economic benefit of owning the cars. In other words, it was a good investment. It was fun. They liked having shiny things in the garage. Let's spend some money and buy some cars. And they did. Well, today, and I would say for a point of reference, I think that probably August of 2014, in my mind, was the peak of the collector car market in terms of values and appreciation. So if I look at what's happened, let's call it January 1st of 15 through today, there's an enormous amount of interest. And in fact, our business is as good or better than it's ever been, but it's different. So the people that are buying cars from Hyman Limited today are people who truly, truly, truly have an interest in owning that car and they know why they want to own it. So for some time, people would call me up and they'd say, hey, Mark, how much is that car? I'd tell them about the car. What kind of condition is it in? I'd tell them the condition. They might ask me if it runs good and if it leaks oil. And then they'd send me the money. Now, now they call me and they know it probably at least as much as I know about the car. They have very intelligent questions because they've done the research and they have interest in owning the car, not because they perceive uh, it to be a good investment and not because they perceive it to, to appreciate. They want to own the car because they want that car. And I love that. I really enjoy that because it's a different buyer. That doesn't mean that we don't have some of both, but we're talking about trends. So I think there's a return to the enthusiast, and that's, to me, what owning a vintage car should be uh, all about. For 30 years I've been in this business, if somebody were walk in my office and say, hey, Mark, what should I buy that's a good investment? My answer has always been the following. I really don't know. I would suggest if you're looking for an investment, you call your stockbroker because that's not my job. My job is to is to provide a car that you like. And and I've always said to him, I said, look, if I sell you this car for a hundred thousand dollars and you love it, and somebody offers you 120 next week, you're gonna say no. And if you love it and it's worth fifteen or twenty thousand dollars less, you're not gonna care. And that to me is what owning a vintage car should be like and all about. So again, that is my canned response because especially during those times when we had a lot of money, people coming in to the hobby, there was nothing wrong with that. There was a lot of benefits for all of us, but it's not what my business was about. The other thing is that I was asked on three separate occasions to be the, a financial advisor and the guy that was to buy cars for these vintage car investment funds. I had three separate groups come to St. Louis, sit down in my conference room and say, we would like for you to be the guy who heads up this group. We're going to raise 10 to $20 million round one. And we want you to be the guy that goes and spends that money, invest the cars, bring the cars in your facility, decide when to sell them and manage this fund for us. And I looked at them and I said, I have absolutely no interest in the concept and I have absolutely no interest in participating. And they looked at me like I was nuts, but it's not what I stand for. It's not what I believe in. And I also said to them, I said, look, you're doing this at the, at the top of the marketplace. I don't believe in what you're saying to me. I don't believe in, in the concept. And I just, I, I, I'm not interested. You know? yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, to go back, go back to trends. So yeah. I think that there is a shift away from people buying cars for investment purpose and a return to being to people buying cars for the right reason. And that is because they're an enthusiast, they love the car, and they want to drive the car. So Mark, so we've talked about the market in general. Let's go specific now. On this show, we're going to talk about three very special cars in your life. One that you've bought, one that you've uh -huh. sold, 
and one that you're going to hang on to. So let's start with the buy. Talk about a car okay. that you chased, that you really wanted, why you decided you wanted, how you finally landed it, the whole process. Tell us about the buy of your life. Well, Keith, I've bought and sold close to 7,000 cars. It's difficult to pick one for many, for the, the ticks, all the boxes for all the right reasons. But if and I could tell you about one car that I bought that I still have that I'll never sell and why I love it. Or are you talking well, let's about, talk about a buy, Mark? Let's let's talk. Let's talk about something that you maybe you didn't expect. It was a barn find. I know you've got some Bentley stories. I know you've been to Russia looking at cars. Pick one story that you think will really resonate with us. Well, I think we could talk about my eight liter Bentley because my eight liter Bentley is a car that to me ticks all the boxes. It is a car that I dreamt of owning for many, many years, but didn't think I'd ever buy. And the one that I currently have is a car that I, frankly, I stumbled on it. And this goes back 15, 18 years. And I was going to Ohio to look at a 1937 Court fan. And I got to the guy's house and his wife said, oh, he won't be here till tonight. I'm very, very sorry. So I thought, okay, well, I got to go kill the day. So I thought about who I might know or who have met that might be in the area. And I remembered meeting a guy at the auctions years before by the name of Roy Wild. And I called Roy and I said, hey, Roy, it's Mark Hyman. Um, I'm in the area. Are you around? And he kind of laughed and he said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I am. And he gave me his address. So it was about an hour drive. I go over and he was in Canton, Ohio. And I go over. And I pull up in front of this enormous home, but that was completely dilapidated. I mean, really trashed with weeds growing in the yard and junk cars in the front yard. And I thought, where am I? It was almost like the, the monsters or something, you know, <laughs> it was, it was crazy. It was eerie. I pull in this gravel driveway and this weeds in the driveway and I knock on the door and he comes out, make a long story short or shorter. He now lived in Florida. This was his home that he lived in for many, many, many years in Ohio, but he no longer lived there. He happened to be in town when I called him. So I go in the backyard. There's trees, literally trees growing through the swimming pool. There's trash. There's I walk in the house. There's junk everywhere. And he says, come on, I'll show you my cars. So in the basement of the house, there was about a dozen cars, uh, like 12 cylinder Lagondas, Ghost. Bentleys, Cadillacs, Corvettes, just all kinds of stuff. Mark, did you know he had, he had these cars? Did you know that he had these I, cars? No. Well, I knew he had an eight liter Bentley. That I knew. Okay. Yeah. That I knew. So then he takes me to the barn, which happened to be a very large metal building back in the woods. And it, it, he used to be many years ago, he was a real estate developer and he owned like a quarry or something. So he had all this construction equipment and earth moving equipment and all this equipment was back in the woods and there was just big metal building and he opens the metal building and gentlemen, I about, I, 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 I freaked in this metal building was about 40 cars. And when he parked them in there many, many years ago, they were inches away from each other. But all the tires, some of the tires had gone flat. So now the tires, the cars were leaning and they were touching each other. And there was junk thrown on top of them, like household goods and boxes and just stuff, right? So I walked in there and I, I, I was speechless, just like I am now, right? And I walk in and I said, Roy, what are you going to do with all these cars? Now, Roy, at this point, he's since passed, but he was in his mid-80s. And he wasn't very, wasn't very good on his feet. You know, he was, he was not doing well. And I said, Roy, what are you going to do with these cars? He goes, I'm going to restore them all. Uh -huh. said, of course you are. Of course yeah. you are. Yeah. And I, and then, and then I said to him, I said, well, what do you think this one's worth? I said, no, no, that's not. I said, what well, are they? Would you sell any? He said, no. And then I said to him, what do you think this one's worth? And he actually gave me a number. And after about the third car, I started writing down all the numbers on a little tiny piece of paper that I had in my, in my pocket. So as the day goes on, 
I wrote down every car and a number that he had associated with every car, which was interesting, an interesting thing to have done since they weren't going to be for sale. Right. So then we, then we go to lunch. We have a hamburger and two or three beers. Well, I think what he says, Mark, I've, I've watched you for years. I love what you do. I love the kind of cars you like. You know, we share a lot and, and we, we really do have a lot in common. Let's, let's leave it at that. Okay. So then he takes me back to the house and I meet his wife. Again, the two of them were in town. They, they didn't live there and they were the, ultimate collectors. They had collections of lamps and dolls and books and art and jewelry and coins and on and on and on and on. And, on. and I sat down with them in the living room and I, we were having just a friendly talk about cars and fun and whatever car people talk about. And she said to me, Mark, what do you think of the cars? I said, oh, they're fabulous. I said, what are you going to do with them? And she says, well, I would like him to sell the cars. And I said, and we talked about that for 20 minutes. And I looked at him and I said, Roy, let me ask you a question. If I were willing to write you a check for the entire collection, for the values that you told me throughout the day, would you sell him? And he said, well, how much was that? And my heart, gentlemen, my heart was beating so fast. You had no idea. <laughs> so was his uh, wife. I, I, my heart was racing. I, I didn't know if I, I didn't know how I kept my composure together. So I added up all the numbers and I told him what that number was. And he looked at her and she looked at him and they said, you have a deal. Wow. And not only that, she walked in the kitchen and grabbed a file full of titles. It was unbelievable. So I wrote them a check. She handed me all these titles, which is like almost 50 cars. And there were pre-war ghosts and eight liter Bentleys and a four and a half liter Bentley. And I mean, on and on and on and on. And there wasn't a car in the pile that wasn't of some importance. And this was a long time ago. So this was before I really had a warehouse full of important cars. You know, this was, this was a long time ago and my heart was racing. I couldn't believe it. So after it was done and I wrote him a check, I said, okay, look, I'll be back. I think it was on a Friday. I said, I'll be back on Monday with my crew and we'll get to work. I walked out of their home. I called my right-hand man, Sean, who I think you guys know. And I said, Sean, get a piece of paper and a pencil and listen carefully. And, and, I, was, and I was talking 100 miles an hour. I said, I need five tractor trailers. I need my truck. I need da-da-da-da-da. And I rattled off all the equipment I needed. And, did, 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 and this is what we're doing. And this is when we're doing it. And I want everybody from my office here on Monday morning and Bottom line is, on Monday morning, we were there. We moved close to 50 cars out of a barn, loaded them onto trucks, and brought them all to St. Louis. It was amazing. And, and I guess I've had a lot, a lot, a lot of interesting, amazing barn find stories since. But that's got to be the best. I mean, it was just, <laughs> it, it, was, it was amazing. It was, I mean, I've got, I've got some other great, great stories of barn finds, but this one was amazing because it was, I mean, yes, it was fortuitous, but it was also a guy that I, oh, and, and not only that, so I, there was two eight liter Bentleys in the pile. My initial plan was to keep them both. So I got both of them running. I spent a lot, a lot of money on one of them because I knew I'd keep that one. And then they had an eight liter Bentley class at the old Meadowbrook Concours many years ago. And I called Roy, by the way, post sale, Roy became a really good friend of mine. And I used to talk to him once a week. And so I called Roy up. I said, Hey, Roy, in August, Meadowbrook is having an eight liter Bentley class. I would be honored if you would join me and we're going to show both your eight liters at Meadowbrook. So he did do that. And we had a great time together Very and nice. he died about three months after that. Wow. What a story. Um, but it was, but it was, it was a great story, but 
so that's the car though that bent, that eight liter Bentley I still have. I tour it all over the United States. I've had it in tours in Europe many times. It's my favorite car. It ticks all the boxes. You know, it's it's big, it's bad, it's beautiful, it's noisy, it's loud. It's like driving a, a, a locomotive on wheels. But <laughs> it's just, you know, I can put four people in it, go 100 miles an hour all day long, and 100 miles an hour in an automobile is a lot of fun. A lot it's of fun. a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, let's yeah. let's move yeah. forward, Mark, to this next question. And this has to do with a memorable sale, a vehicle that uh, you've owned, that you've let go, that was uh, maybe something that you kind of may say, maybe I shouldn't have let that thing go. I'm going to give you a list of things that I've sold in the last four or five years that are kind of amazing. And then I'll pick the one that I like, if that's okay. I've sold, in the last couple of years, I've sold three Pebble Beach Best of Show winners. The Delage D8 de Villers, the Delahaye 135 that won Pebble Beach, and the Lancia Astura that won Pebble Beach. In fact, the Lancia Astura was a car that I bought about eight years ago. I sold it to a gentleman who restored it. He put it back in Pebble Best, won Best of Show. And after the show, I said, well, now what are you going to do with it? He said, you're taking it home, and I want you to sell it for me. So. That was three best of show Pebble winners. I bought and sold a Delage D8 Aerosport with coach work by La Junior and Marchand, Taubo Teardrop, several W.O. Bentleys, the 1919 Purcero that was the Fetty Ar- Arbuckle car, the purple one, two Tuckers, a Stout Scarab, several Bugattis, a Doble Steamer, several Duesenbergs, 427 and 289 Cobras, 300 SLs, the very first Isada Freshini, which is an amazing story. So I get my point is a lot, a lot of amazing, amazing things have come through my hands. The one car that I bought, sold, and wish I still had, I'd have to say my my thirty two Duesenberg J three fifty four that I found about fifteen years ago. I dreamt of owning it for many, many years. I bought it because it was I was passionate about the car. I showed it, I toured it, I had a great time in it. And I didn't sell it because I wanted to sell it. I sold it because I had already done four Duesenberg tours. I'd already had it in five concours around the United States. And it was a significant investment. And I'd already done everything I could do with it. So I sold it. But I but I miss it. I love it. And my emotions say I shouldn't have sold it. And my uh, business savvy, if you if that's what you can call it, say I made the right choice. Is there one that you'll never let go, Mark? My leader Bentley. That one. Yeah, kind of thought that might be it. Cool. Well, we're going to come back in just a second. I want to say thanks to an advertiser here and another special deal that our team at Sports Car Market has for our listeners. And we get back, he's going to ask you, Kind of the last question here about the perfect all-around collector car. So we'll be right back. I've been subscribing to Sports Car Market Magazine for decades, and it shows up like clockwork in my mailbox every month. But what about when I'm on the road? Did you know that digital subscriptions to Sports Car Market are just $2.50 a month when you sign up with the promo code DIGITAL50? That's less than a cup of coffee. You get 50% off regular price just for listening here to Buy, Sell, Hold. Plus, digital subscribers receive instant access to a year's worth of back issues and the exclusive Insider's Guide, including the 2020 Insider's Guide to the beautiful Amelia Island Concourse, and all the spring auctions as well. No more boredom while sitting at the airport or on your flight. To get your Sports Car Market digital subscription at this discount, go to sportscarmarket.com slash digital50. Your order will automatically get you the 50% off. What a deal. Go and sign up today at sportscarmarket.com slash digital50. All right, we're back. Keith has another challenging question for our friend Mark here today. I think we could talk to you for hours. Take it away, Keith. So, Mark, let's step outside the box here with your 7,000 cars you bought and sold. Let's talk about a car that you haven't owned that you look at and you think, God, I wish I owned that one because I could do everything in it. I know you've got your eight liter that 
that does that those things. But let's what's another car that you look at and you think I could do everything I want with that car, and every time I look at it, it would make my heart race. And it's just kind of the perfect car, but I don't have it now. Keith, it's an easy, easy, easy question to answer. It's a car that I've lusted after for years, and I promise you, I will one day accomplish it. And it's it's an Alpha HC touring bodied spider. I've played with lots and lots of post war cars, and I love them. But you know, my heart's in the pre war. And what's cooler than an HC? Right. Nice. Yeah, not much. That's for sure. Not much. It ticks all the boxes. It is exquisite, exclusive, fast, amazing. It, it does everything that a guy could ever imagine a motor car to do. Well, there's a reason that all the top collectors that we know have an Alpha 8C in their collection. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I, I've i owned a bunch of 6Cs, and I like them. And maybe... Just maybe the reason I want an HC is because I haven't owned one, but I can't wait to to have that problem <laughs> to figure out <laughs> if, if, to figure out if I really want it. You know? <laughs> so, Mark, let's yeah. let's come back now to today's market and your business. So, how yeah. has the market affected the way that you do business and the way that you collect cars? Well, let me. It has not affected the way I collect cars at all. Because I collect cars because of passion. I don't collect cars to make money. I do buy and sell cars to make money. And I do buy and sell cars for other people to make money. So how I collect cars has not changed. That's that's an emotional thing. Gentlemen, our business has changed a lot with the market. And one of the reasons, is, and it's very significant, is simply that I think that sellers today, and especially sellers of important, hence valuable cars, have a desire and a need to protect their investment and protect the the provenance of the car. And what I mean by that is this. If you had, let's pick a car. Let's take a a Ferrari 330 GTS is an example, or a 300 SL Goldwing. And more importantly, let's not take these. Let's not use those two. Let's use an important Delahaye or Delage or Bugatti. In 2010, if you decided that you wanted to sell one of those important automobiles, and you had had it for some time, and you, you really weren't quite sure what the market value was, because the pricing, the values were escalating and changing, probably quicker than an individual owner knew and understood. So if you took your car to an auction, the odds were very, very high that you were going to be pleasantly surprised and probably get more for your car than you expected. And that was usually the case. I mean, if we all remember the the evenings in the auction rooms where it was pretty much a a party of environment, a party atmosphere, everybody was happy, the buyers were happy, the sellers were thrilled, the auction companies were enthusiastic, and it was a party. Prices kept going up and up and up, and nobody could make a mistake, it seemed. Well, today it's a little different. I would say this to you. The market is good. The market is strong, but the market is different. And if you have an important car and you wish to sell it and you send it to auction, if it sells and if it works, that's great for everybody involved. But if by chance it doesn't work and it doesn't sell, and what we're seeing today is there, there's a lot of success in the auction room today, but north of a million dollars a year, it's really, really, really thin. And it's difficult to get people to raise their hand for north of a million dollars today. That's a given. So if you have an important car that you want to sell today, and you send it to the auction and it sells, that's great. But if by chance it does not sell, the car that ran across the auction block at a no, with a no sale attached to it now has a stigma. And it's now the, oh, it's that car that didn't sell at auction. And even worse, if by chance the auctioneer happens to hammer that car not sold at a number significantly lower than it should be selling for, 
which happens often. Now you've got a car that we, let's say we think it's worth $2 million. The high bid in the room was a million dollars and it gets printed and published on the internet and in magazines. Oh, that car was a no sale at a million dollars. That now becomes arguably, I'm not going to say it's the value, but arguably that's the new value of a car. So to protect the car and to protect the owner, a lot, a lot of owners are sending important cars to me. And here's the reason. I'm not going to promise a you or anybody that I can sell that car. We do sell, I want to say 92, 93% of our consignments. We are successful placing. And that's a great number. And that's a good percentage. But more importantly, or as importantly, if you send me an important car and I'm not successful, it comes off my website. Nobody knows whether I sold the car. I didn't sell the car. But more importantly, it doesn't get hammered no sale publicly at a number that significantly hurts the provenance and value of the car. So there's no downside is what I'm what I'm trying to say. And in a sensitive market like we have today, owners of important cars are looking to protect the value and provenance of the car. And that's something we do. There you go. Good. Words of wisdom. <laughs> Uh, no, yeah. it, it's yeah, great. It's it, great. It's an interesting advantage or byproduct of the way we operate that I never really anticipated would occur. Uh, we've always been successful selling cars. We've always been successful with a consignment program, but our consignment program has really ramped up over the last 18 months considerably and not because I've asked for it. Not that I don't like it. I do like it. But the demand from people with important cars has become evident. And they call us and say, look, we've got a going. We've got a Roadster. We've got a Bugatti. We've got a Delage. I just sold the best of show winning Delage for an important collector. He did not want that car to go across an auction block. And obviously, he said, Mark, can you sell the car? I said, well, this is what I think it's worth. I think I can sell the car. I'll take it home with me and I'll try in worst case scenario, I'll bring it back to you, but it's not going to negatively impact the car. Well, bottom line is we sold the car, so it wasn't an issue. The other part of it also is one of the reasons our business is great is right now people want to buy turnkey cars. They want to buy cars with no stories and they want to buy a car that when it gets delivered, they got no aggravation. That's one of the other things we bring to the table I've got a shop with 10 guys in there that are really, really, really good. So when a car comes into our place, whether it's a car I own or it's a consignment car, the first thing that happens is it goes through that shop. It goes through our detail shop. And I'm not going to say to you that we fix every single thing initially, but when you call me, I have a report in my computer from my shop that tells me, Everything that works, everything that doesn't work, how it runs, how it drives, how it steers, what might be some items that the car does need so that when a customer calls me or my sales staff, we can answer the question by saying, it went through the shop, here's the report. It gives the buyer peace of mind and it gives the buyer an understanding of exactly what he's buying rather than guessing. Absolutely. Well, there you have it from an expert uh, about buying, selling, holding cars. Mark, you always have a treasure trove of inspiration and knowledge. And I think this has been a fantastic talk. And like I said earlier, we could talk forever. Uh, One last little piece of wisdom and guidance you could maybe give somebody in a simple sentence or two when it comes to buying, holding, or selling cars. I would tell anybody who's interested in buying a car, buy what you love and then by the best example of what you love that you can afford. Perfect. What's the best way for our listeners to find you and learn more about your business? Well, our cars are on offer on our website, which is www.hymanltd.com, or you're free to give us a call at 314-524-6000. 
You could look at Mark's ad in Sports Car Market Magazine, where he has his fabulous cars for sale. Absolutely. I always love those. I call those dream ads. I sit there and go, which one would I pick today? So you're always teasing (laughs) us here. Well, listeners, you can again find all these resources and Mark's business resources on the show notes page at Sports Car Market Magazine, their website, or on Cars Yeah. We'll have everything there. And if you'd like to listen to my talk with Mark, you know, you were my guest number 259 way back in May of 2015, but the show's still there on the Cars Yeah website. So you can go back and see see how Mark's changed over time. And me too. Hopefully I've gotten a little better. Hey, Mark, thanks for being so generous <laughs> today with your time and expertise. Always a pleasure to talk with you. Gentlemen, thank yes. you. And I appreciate it. Great having you on board, Mark. Absolutely. We'll talk with you soon. All right, guys. We'll talk soon. All right, man. Hey, Mark Green here. If you love the Buy, Sell, Hold podcast, you'll want to listen to my Cars Yeah podcast. We're over five years I've interviewed over 1,475 inspiring automotive enthusiasts. You'll have free access to my guest shows five days a week. These are amazing people who share their world around cars, trucks, and motorcycles. I take a deep dive into their businesses, and they share with you how they've wrapped their passion for vehicles into their lives. Plus, go to the CarsYeah.com website and hit the free book button, and I'll email you my free filler-up book. It's an ebook filled with beautiful fuel filler fun and inspiring quotes from my past guests. Once subscribed, you'll get my weekly blog as well. You can find all the Cars Yeah shows on CarsYeah.com or on any mobile device using your podcast app. Just search for Cars Yeah Podcast and subscribe today. That way you'll get both Buy, Sell, Hold with Keith and me and the Cars Yeah Podcast delivered right to your mobile device or your computer. Thanks for listening. We hope you have shed some light today on the collector car market. You can listen to all the Buy, Sell, Hold podcasts at sportscarmarket.com and carsyeah.com. You'll find hundreds of inspiring automotive enthusiasts on the Cars Yeah website as well. Be sure to log into sportscarmarket.com and subscribe to Keith's SCM weekly newsletter. You'll find digital issues, insider event guides, and price guides, along with our platinum database, column profiles, classifieds, and many other resources. Join Keith and Mark next week to hear from another automotive industry leader who will help you determine when to buy, sell, or hold.